Greetings programs, it's David at DCES UK and today I'm reporting on this, a Hager Bluetooth Arc fault detection device. This is prompted by my previous video where Linda and I attended the ELECT show in Coventry and were somewhat unconvinced by some of the sales claims being made about this product on the Hager stand. Those who've kept a BDI on my unsavoury output over the years will perhaps recall I was on my soapbox about AFDDs before most others on this here platform. I first got my nipple twisters onto an AFDD way back in 2018 before spaffing out two technical follow-ups in December of 2020 where I properly put one through its paces before taking the horrendously pricey plunge to install them into my own consumer unit. Although AFDDs had slowly started appearing out in the wild since being first mooted for the sewage-drenched shores of this miserable grey island back in 2018, it wasn't until BS7671 18th edition Amendment 2 dolloped onto our doormats in March of 2022 did most folks start taking them seriously, as it was this change which made them mandatory for houses of multiple occupation, purpose-built student accommodation, care homes and buildings over 18 metres or six stories, whichever comes first. There are today still some myths and nonsense surrounding AFDDs, and Linda and I weren't particularly impressed with what we heard being spouted out of the Hager stand, although we were intrigued to know how their test simulator worked. Sadly, I imagine I'll never know, as I've previously not had anything particularly good to say about Hager, and they're not gonna like me anymore after this presentation, I'm sure. I've got nothing against Hager as a whole, I just don't think they're the dog's bollocks they think they are. Anyway, here's the problem with having a stand at a show such as a Lex. You can't just stick the sales team on it and have them flog you their products, or the philosophy behind their products, as if they know what life as an installer or maintainer is like. Having a sales bod telling me their product will make my job easier when they've no experience of what it means to be out on site and doing my job gets my back up and my man tits hard. Hager's website has a meet the team section. These are your salespeople, and I'm going to hover on the central region because Tracy, Georgia and Henry were on the stand. Maybe others, I don't know. And honestly, I'm not here to put them down. But where are these guys from the tech team? I want to tell them what concerns I have about their AFDD offering and have them address those technical queries. Not someone from sales who, for all I know, has never twiddled a screwdriver in their life and is towing some spiel thought up in a marketing brainstorm back at Hager headquarters. In my prior video, it was poor old Henry who got the short straw in talking to me and Linda, but it could just as easily have been one of the others. Some of our time talking to Henry was cut from the edit, both for pacing when he couldn't get his AFDD to talk to his phone, because, yeah, more on that later, and also because there were claims being made that I really wanted to argue the toss about, but I don't want to get into an argument with any given sales bod on camera. Take Ledvance, for example. They had a stand at Alex, and I was in two minds about asking their rep on camera why their products are shite, following a short in July where I was bemoaning the number of failed Ledvance floodlights we'd been installing. They had one of these very floodlights on their stand, so they obviously think it's a worthy product in their arsenal, and I want to ask the guy how I could trust anything in their lighting range if that particular item had so badly let me down. But I didn't, because he's just a sales git, paid to man a stand and hand out leaflets, He's got no hotline back to the management team to report that some loudmouth says their wares are shite, so there's no point in my making him look like a cunt on camera. Nonetheless, the company line Hager's sales team is spouting forth should be addressed here today, because things were said, whether they made the edit or not, that I, as an installer and maintainer of electrical installations, do not agree with. So this video isn't about trying to show anyone up, it's to offer a counterpoint that you, dear viewer, or Hager, might or might not agree with. The comment section is open, so discuss and engage. Now I've moaned about Hager's pricing in my recent Trip Trap video where I showed CEF were charging about as much for a 100 amp Hager RCD as they were for a consumer unit that contained two of the fucking things. Well this AFDD I've procured from Consumer Unit World, who used to carry a discount code for this channel, but that seems to have gone. Anyway, a 100 amp 30 milliamp Type A RCD is £45.96 on there, although they too sell the dual RCD unit for £73.50, which is cheaper than buying two individual RCDs. Go figure. These AFDDs are being punted at £83.99 on Consumer Unit World, which is less than Wilex or Ludum models. Only Fusebox clock in cheaper, at least on there, and considering Hager's AFDD has Bluetooth connectivity, a real-time clock, and internal logging, I'm surprised they're not at a higher price point. Not that I consider those features to necessarily be value for money, as I shall eventually come to. 
So Hager's offering has extra whistles and bells, but can I show it all working here in my admittedly amateur test environment? Let's look at the product and what it's supposed to do before we go squirting some power and some fault simulations through it. First thing to note is that this is a single module full height device. That's a shame because compact RCBOs have recently become the new norm across most ranges, like this true two pole SBS QT right here. Retrofitting RCBOs into busy enclosures is an easier task at this smaller size. Even my Wilex AFDDs from 2020 are half height affairs, which makes me wonder if Hagen need the extra real estate in their packaging for tomfoolery such as Bluetooth chipset, antenna, clock and memory. In the box we get an LED status label to indicate what the colour or flash rate means, and again, as stated back in the video of my own home installation three years ago, it's a shame there was no standardisation of indication as each manufacturer has their own particular disco light colours and flash sequences. A quick reminder of my setup here, and my Siemens AFDD from 2018 is a two module unit with a red indicator for normal operation. Next to my test rig is my arc chamber, which can simulate a series arc fault that should trip off any AFDD. By adjusting a control wheel on the underside, I can vary the gap between these two brass contact points, which will interrupt a load current causing arcing to occur. Allow me to demonstrate, if you will. A 20 watt fan doesn't produce much in the way of fireworks, but if I were to switch on a 2 kilowatt heating element, we should see more of a flash before the AFDD both throws in the towel and pulls the plug. There you are, and the flashing yellow light tells us on this particular device that the trip was down to an arc fault and not an overload or earth leakage event. I'll do it again once more with the office lights off. Beautiful. Works every time. Okay, now the Hager unit is installed and I've removed the front cover from my arc chamber so we can all better see quite what happens as it happens. It's not ideal to have covers removed and live parts exposed, but I'm trying to show things in action here and my hangover has just about cleared enough for me to be considered as a skilled person, perhaps. I've installed the Hager Pilot app onto my mobile phone, which wants nearly all of my information, of course, only my inside leg measurement and the fact my dick hangs to the left seems to be missing from the sign-up screens. Sadly, the app bombs out every time I submit my details with a something went wrong error. This is problem number one with this kind of interconnected equipment. It's only as good as its app. And what the fuck do Hager know about writing software? Let's say I'm on site putting 16 of these into a HMO and my fucking phone is telling me something went wrong before I can even get past the registration process. The temporary URL has expired. Well, I couldn't have filled the fucking form in any quicker and I've done it twice. But maybe something didn't go that wrong because despite the app error, an activation email has arrived. And clicking the link brings up a picture of this guy who looks like he's laughing at my pain. It's now let me sign in and it says, hello David, what would you like to do? What would I like to do? I'd like to hire in Olga and Kinga, a couple of low cost Eastern European hookers I know to jack me off into their faces. But I don't see why Hager need to know that. Update AFDD firmware. Okay, let's see if this son of a bitch needs to know what's changed in the world of electrical physics since it left the factory. I've got to hold down the button for a few seconds to put it into Bluetooth pairing mode. And apparently it's already up to date. Pairing allows some configuration to set parameters such as circuit name, number, personal notes. Here's problem number two with this thing. Why have Hager incorporated this connectivity and customization into an individual AFDD unit? On the Hager stand, they said it was for the benefit of the installer. <laughs> I'm sorry, how's that now? Again, if I have 16 of these cocksuckers to wang in on site, Hager seemingly expect me to have an account, the app, data service, and to pair with each AFDD individually to perform a firmware update, if needed, and to configure the individual fields. How does that help me as an installer? On a Wilex board, I'd simply physically bolt in the AFDDs like they were RCBOs, and I'd fuck off down the pub without worrying about the state of the friggin' firmware or having to customise each device to assign it a name and number. As an installer, this does not make my life easier. It demonstrably complicates my day. Hager's next boast on the stand at LX was the trip log. 
Oh, this is interesting, as four events are already listed, and I haven't even started tickling its bollocks yet. Is this factory testing? I don't know, they're, they're all Earth leakage logs, so it's not like we're seeing a series arc test, a parallel arc test, an Earth leakage test, and an overcurrent test going on here. Unless these are supposed to be some kind of sample examples, it just looks like my device is second-hand, and I've bought something some other mug has been playing around with. Thing is, you have the LED indication like on every other AFDD, so an event log is of questionable value. I know from my 2018 Siemens unit whether the trip was art fault, earth leakage or overload based on what the LED shows. One yellow flash for arc, three yellow flashes for RCD and no change to the red status indicator for overcurrent. The Heger device also has a physical indication to quickly convey the nature of the last trip, so long as you have a key to hand to decipher what the colour combinations are all about and the app can tell you that if the sticker is missing. Earlier I mentioned Hager shoehorning a real-time clock into this thing, but that's apparently erroneous, as looking at the log I see the events have no date and time entries, just a count timer between them. So really, that's not telling you much at all. It doesn't aid in the headache of fault finding in any significant way. You still need to figure out where on the circuit that fault is, and correct it. Another of Hager's claims at Alex was that new appliances were upsetting AFDDs and they could issue new firmware to eliminate false positives from known hardware incompatibilities. Hmm. I don't think there's been a plethora of appliances coming to market that have troubled AFDDs. Most of the time any individual appliance won't upset an AFDD unless it has a loose connection within its flex or plug top or if connections within have been compromised to cause parallel arcing. In those cases, the AFDD should legitimately detect the fault and operate accordingly. Some appliances will be naturally electrically noisy, like this drill, whose motor display is arcing as part of its normal operation. But this kind of arc doesn't have the signature the AFDD is looking for. It also needs saying that an AFDD can only detect arc faults on the supply side of the wiring. I hear people mention Grenfell in relation to the use of AFDDs, but the Grenfell fire was caused by a faulty appliance not a fault on the fixed wiring. Permit me to demonstrate. Take something that uses arcs, like a welder, for example. Or, in the case of my twat cave, my 10 kilovolt Jacob's ladder. I can use this thing to create a 10,000 volt series arc on the output of this very AFDD. Will it trip? Those who saw me perform this demonstration with my Siemens Model 5 years ago already know that it won't. But for the benefit of the Hager sales team, let's hang this fucker off the asshole end of their device. There you go. Now that's a motherfucking bona fide series fucking arc if ever I saw one. Yet the Hager is sitting there dumb as all shit with its green light giving it a big, well there's nothing to see here, geezer. Why is that? Well, for the exact same reason as when I showed it back in 2018. That 10 kilovolt arc is not on the supply side, it's on the output of a step-up transformer, so the AFDD doesn't see it. And that should be the same for an arc welder, or most any other appliance, perhaps with the exception of the likes of my drill which is arcing on the supply side, albeit with a signature that the device recognises as being a motor. Nothing on the market should be introducing rogue arc signatures onto the supply wiring for an AFDD to erroneously detect and nuisance trip on. For all but the most basic of appliances, you'll have a transformer, opto-isolator, or some sort of separation between supply and any electronics. Hager claiming they can update the firmware to account for devices that may erroneously trip an AFDD through normal operation seems to me to be possible, albeit largely... pony. That is fucking pony. Well, so far it seems to not be too wonderful for the installer to offer little of value to someone performing maintenance and fault finding, and firmware updates are a questionable advantage at best. Even if Hager did decide that they had a firmware update that addressed a particular issue, are they seriously expecting me to revisit all prior installations where I fitted one of these bastards to individually update every single device? Who's paying for that, especially if the update is to address something like a security or safety issue Hager identify after release, which is no fault of my own or of my customer? Which brings me on to smart consumer units. 
This is something I've mentioned a couple of times before, the last instance being in April 2022 during my rambling view on Amendment 2 video. I queried the Hager chap at Alex on why this functionality was being built into individual AFDDs instead of there being a centralised CPU, only to be told this way was probably more cost effective. Nonsense. The CPU in one of these devices has the power to watch over all circuit ways in any consumer unit. Arc fault overload and earth leakage can all be monitored by a central processor across multiple circuit ways. That's electrically and physically possible, and that will happen. It's just a matter of time before one manufacturer puts in the R&D and brings such to market. Not that I personally like the idea of it much, but it makes more sense than building it into individual devices. Configuration and firmware updates can be applied per board rather than per device, and duplication of physical processing, memory and Bluetooth or other networking components can be reduced. Devices such as this are not the future, but if I were to don my aluminium foil hat, I'd say doing it this way allows the manufacturers to sell us these devices now before they invent the new super consumer unit of the future, at which point they'll obsolete these things overnight. There's also nothing to stop Hager from deciding they're going to obsolete AFDD 1.0 in favour of their super new half-height all-sexy AFDD 2.0 in two years' time, with future app updates refusing to connect to old devices. Remember the good old days when you only had to ensure protective devices were type tested for the board? Well, not like now where you have to ensure the device is above a minimum firmware level. Maybe Hager will also decide to charge a monthly micropayment for installers or end clients who want to ensure they receive the latest updates. Again, this was put to the stand at Alex, and our man simply shook his head as he continued to try and figure out why his Bluetooth dingus wasn't working. But who's to say Hager won't want a quid a month per AFDD for updates in a change to terms and conditions sometime from now? That's affordable, right? What's that? You have 12 AFDDs in your CU? Oh, inflation means it's now a quid 50 per month. Two quid. I know. Blame the Tories. Blame climate change. 250 a month. Blame Sadiq Khan and net zero. Security is another thing. I also brought this up at the Hager stand, but it got brushed to one side. Hager's stance on this being hackable was that you'd have to be up close and personal to access it in order to put it into Bluetooth mode. Then you'd need to be within 10 metres to communicate. Well, the thing with hacking is that every corporate thinks they're secure until some autistic child genius figures out a way around it. Who's to say for 100% sure that you have to come and push the physical button on this thing to get it talking? Hager might be pretty cocksure about it, but let them put out a statement that reads, we guarantee our AFDDs are 100% non-hackable and anyone who says otherwise is a ponce. They can be as confident as they want on the sales stand, but will they make a robust claim such as this? Somehow I can't see them throwing down the gauntlet to the global hacking community to prove they're bulletproof, and even if their AFDD devices turn out to be so, are their servers perfectly secure now that they host all my details and the information of this device I've been talking to? The problem with a lot of today's tech is that manufacturers seem to feel they're missing out if they're not clinging onto the smart bandwagon. But just because you can make something smart doesn't mean you have to. I can see advantages to a smart CU if it's done right, but I'm not convinced this is it. This feels like an interim step by Hager, something more than the likes of Wilex, Ludent and Fusebox offer, which allows them to puff out their chests and claim to be first to market with smart protective devices. But nonetheless, this is still a gimmick. The first company that brings out a truly smart CU with centralised control, and one that doesn't require the whole buzz bar be taken out for a change of any single protective device, will, I'm sure, quickly win converts in this day and age. We've seen new players enter the market in recent years, such as Verso, Skolmore's Elucian Range and CP Fusebox, but individually they all offer nothing new. There's generally no reason to switch to them over anyone else outside of localised pricing and availability. The only brand I've observed to be doing something different, which makes common sense change for the better, is SBS with their dual buzz bar, true two-pole system, and online custom CU configurator, if that's a word. I know Schneider also have a dual buzz bar offering, but not at any pricing sane people would consider. But I'm nobody particularly, just an installer of this stuff, and perhaps one who can vocalise the frustration of my peers more than many. We have enough to deal with under pressure out on site. Manufacturers are either aiding us or perhaps inadvertently getting in our way. 
Like I say, I'm not out to badmouth Hager. There people can agree, disagree, ignore, or engage with what someone like me says. But don't go bullshitting the likes of me and Linda at a trade show. Stick some technical people on your stand who truly know what it means to work with the products you're peddling and who can talk technical when assholes like us throw awkward questions out there. It doesn't even have to be someone on your payroll. At CEF Live, Superod had YouTube's Jimbo the Electrician pay to be on the stand. Now there's someone I can talk to. He can give honest answers as an installer without necessarily towing a party sales line. Anyway, I'm three and a half thousand whinging words into this and I haven't even given it a spin yet. Maybe using the product will change my mind and win me over. Let's give it some aggro. Well, I guess the easiest way to start is probably an RCD test. So let's fire up the MFT Pro. And if this is successful, we should have a steady red light to indicate our trip condition. RCD, type AC one times, that'll be fine. Shove in our probs. Oh. And go. Seven milliseconds. That's within the 300 millisecond trip time you want to see. And if I push in the button, mm, steady red light. Can you see that? Let's, let's get the old zoomeroo onto it, shall we? You can probably just see it there next to my hand. Steady red light. When we power it back up, we get our green light, of course. But what we should see now, I guess, is if I fire up the app on my phone, wherever I've put that, hopefully we should see a trip event, something that says the last trip event was an earth leakage fault. Let's have a look. All right, I'm reconnecting to the device once again. And if we go into the history, well, there you have it. Trip event number five, trip on RCD fault detection. Previous uptime was two hours and 18 minutes. OK, let's see if we can't get some arc logging on the show here. At the start of this video, and indeed in other videos, I've shown the Siemens AFDD work flawlessly, flawlessly with my arc fault chamber here. You'll recall that that's simply two brass contact points connected to this socket outlet. So by sticking a heavy load on that outlet, and earlier we used a fan heater, but now I've got a two kilowatt resistive radiator, then as I bring these two ends together, they'll form a loose connection, which should see some serious arcing, which hopefully the Hager will pick up on and trip out on. Let's use the old zoomerator so you can really see in there. So we're going to be looking around the contact points here near the orange light. I'm going to turn off the, this light over here, actually. Let's make it a little darker just so that you can better see the, the Hager's indicator and what's happening at the, the brass stop ends. So let's move them together. Ooh, fairly fireworky, but Hager's not taking the bait, is it? The Siemens would have tripped off by now. You can hear it snap, crackling and popping away. Uh, I, I'm really not sure why that's not tripping. I, I, I don't know if the, the Hager's looking at and thinking maybe it's a motor or something, but that is definitely not a motor signature. That is very much a loose connection. And anybody who goes, oh, well, that's just sparking, not arcing, David. Well, no, that is arcing. That's a serious arc. That's a loose connection, high energy, and very localized thermal effects there. That is going to be causing some damage in there if I leave it sustained. So I'm really not sure why the Hager's not doing its job there. As far as I'm concerned, it ought to be. And certainly the Siemens would have done. Wow, okay, that's disappointing, isn't it? Um, I'll tell you what. Let's give it a bit of a helping hand. What I'll do is I'll get a bit of uh, kitchen roll, soak it in a bit of salt water, stick it between those two contact points, and that'll get the fucker fizzing. I shouldn't have to go to these sort of extremes because, as I say, that was most definitely a bona fide series arc. Main power on. Let's turn that light off. Arky sparky. Jesus. Whew. 
has a lot of energy being dissipated in there. And it smells bad. Again, it's just not having it, is it? Now, obviously you can look at this and go, well, these are hardly test lab conditions, David. You're just some idiot pissing around with a Lego contraption. But I, I would expect that nonetheless to have, I mean, come on, to have done something. Wow, okay. Tell you what. Let's see if I can make a parallel arc. Uh, I'll be able to do that with a bit of scrap cable and a bit more water. <laughs> Alrighty, let's see if this fools it. What I've done here is, coming from the AFDD, I have a cable going to a socket outlet that the radiator is plugged into. The CPC is not connected. I don't want that as part of the circuit but I have compromised the outer jacket of the insulation and also the inner cores to expose the live copper for both line and neutral. And again, remember the, the CPC is not connected there, it's not doing anything. So if I put a bit of salt water between them, again, having to piss around with salt water, then that will form a path of lesser resistance than the plastics and the air around there. The EMF will overcome the insulation resistance of that. We should get arcing between cores, which may cause either an overload fault or hopefully a parallel arc fault. Well, let's see. Okay, I've applied a liberal spooging of water. What I'm gonna do is I'm gonna switch the AFDD on so that's ready to go and then I'm gonna switch the main power on. So I don't know what this will do or how quick it will react or what. <laughs> yeah, pretty impressive. And certainly some arcing, some smoking, some localised thermal effects. The kind of things you don't want to be happening. The kind of things that this is supposed to be tripping off. I'm sure my Siemens wouldn't have fooled for this. Let's, let's take the energy off, shall we? Um, wow, okay, <laughs> there's one other thing I can, I can try, which I don't imagine is going to be successful because nothing else has been. In a previous video, one of the ones I mentioned to earlier, I built my arc fault tester, which if you'll recall is a couple of heating elements and a fixed width arc gap in here. Uh, I can connect that to the AFDD using some probes. We'll see if that has any effect. This thing's not exactly an exact science. I did a lot of messing around when I made this three years ago to get the arc gap in here just right for the Siemens AFDDs that I've got, or the Wilex AFDDs. Uh, Siemens own Wilex, I believe, if I remember rightly. But if I use this on either my Siemens or Wilex AFDDs, it does the job. The only trouble is, it's got to do the job very quickly because these heating elements in here aren't made to be out of water uh, and they'll just burn themselves out dead quick. So I'm going to put the probes onto this thing and if it's going to do the job, it's going to do it immediately or it's not going to do it at all. So we'll give it a go and see what happens. A horrendously dangerous bit of kit, by the way. Don't go making one at home yourself. <sighs> Nothing. Nothing at all. I just can't get this thing to trip. Uh, I'll tell you what, um, we'll, we'll put the Siemens back in just so we can see something working, just to, just to verify if, if these tests do actually work. Well, I know they do because I've done them before, but, but let's, let me show you an AFDD actually working, which I, I seemingly can't with the Hager. Right, let's repeat our testing in reverse order. So we'll start with the AFDD tester. The Siemens is live again. I'm just going to put that between line and neutral and it should, like I say, there you go, trip off. That's because of the fixed arc gap in there. That won't go back on until I hit the reset button and it will come back on flashing a yellow light to say that's an arc fault mate. Do you want a close up of the yellow light? Do you? I can give you a close up of the yellow light. There you go. Don't say I never give you anything. 
not necessarily in focus, but a close-up of the yellow light. Pushing that resets the indicator back to red. So, successful series arc test with my AFDD tester. If you want to know more about how that's made and how it works, you'll have to watch the video in the description. <sighs> Let's set this up again with the parallel arc. Now we're not actually too sure how successful this test is really going to be. I don't think I've ever tried to do a parallel arc test before. But, you know, I, I don't see why it wouldn't work. Let's get some more moisture across those cores. I'll, I'll angle the camera down because it was, it was a bit fireworky last time, wasn't it? And I, I imagine you want to see the, uh, see the arcs and sparks. Uh, so the AFDD is on. And the AFDD is off. Look at that. That just went straight away. Parallel arc fault. Exactly as you would expect to see. You've got to imagine that... Oh, this goes, goes again, look. <laughs> You've got to imagine that this is a compromised cable, something that a rodent has chewed through, it's outside, it's exposed to moisture. This is exactly where you're going to get this kind of parallel arc fault. And yes, that is doing exactly what it's supposed to be doing. It is going, fucking hell, mate. There's a high energy arc effect going on here. I'm tripping off. And I know it's a parallel arc and not an overload fault that it's tripped on because if I do get the power back on, reset it, again we get a flashing yellow light to say that trip event was an arc fault. If it was an overload fault, then the indicator would have remained red because that tripping off, this is an RCBO that's attached to the arc fault device, that tripping off or that manually being switched off, the FDD doesn't know it's asked from its elbow as far as that's concerned. All it knows is that the RCBO is tripped off. So it doesn't give any kind of status indicator. It just keeps its red light. So the flashing yellow light means that our parallel arc test was successful. Let's get the uh, the series arc test going on this, uh, this arc chamber here, this now fairly burnt out arc chamber. Okay, where's my radiator plug? Where's that gone? I just had that a minute ago. Right here. <clears throat> Let's plug that into the arc chamber. Move the cable out of the way. You're going to want the camera changed. Fucking hell, get up there, will you, you bastard? Let's move the camera so that you can better see the chamber. All high tech, this, isn't it? Turn off the light. And once we energize, we get the orange warning light within there to say this is all live mate keep your fingers away and as i adjust the contact points together perfect perfecta mundo and once again the yellow light says that was an arc trip my man not anything else so i really don't know what to say about that i mean the siemens the Wilex, whatever you want to call it, the Crabtree, they're all the same brand. That does what I expect it to do. And maybe there's something about the Hager that's its firmware, I don't know, is just not being fooled by my tomfoolery in this instance. But series arcing is series arcing. Parallel arcing is parallel arcing. This shouldn't be looking at, at what I'm doing and thinking, hmm, yeah, I'm not being fooled by that. There's fucking fireworks going on here, mate. And I really don't know why that isn't playing ball. So I'm sorry I can't show you it in operation and uh, I'm afraid I have zero confidence in its efficacy because I haven't seen it work in here today. I just can't get it to um, to simulate what it's supposed to simulate. So, you know, it's uh, I'm going to have to say that don't go for the... Don't necessarily get fooled by the whistles and bells that Hager are offering with their connectivity and their app and all that stuff. If you're putting in AFDDs, Go for Crabtree and Wilex. I haven't got any experience with other brands. Maybe Fusebox is okay. Perhaps I'll have to get hold of some other some other models and try them out. But certainly, uh, Wilex and Crabtree, which are owned by Electrium, which is owned by Siemens, does what it says on the fucking tin. The problem with AFDDs is there's a computer inside this package and that greatly complicates this device over a traditional breaker or RCD. 
There are no test instruments to prove the efficacy of arc fault operation, so we installers are completely reliant on devices living up to the manufacturer's claims, both straight out of the box and for the long term following installation. Hager say this thing performs an hourly sanity check, and the accompanying leaflet details a flashing yellow light as being a sign that it's failed this internal self-test. But my device is reporting as being healthy, yet I cannot prove it does what it's supposed to do. The leaflet states the AFDD function must be tested after installation, but the only way to prove any kind of operation is to simply push the test button. Yes, that instructs the computer to mechanically clock off the device, but is that really proving the art fault function is operational? Mine is either a dud fresh out of the box, which is worrying as it shows no outward sign of being duff, or it's not detecting the series and parallel arcs I'm throwing at it. I don't see any reason why it wouldn't operate as the Siemens does and pick up today's arcs as being real world events. I've given it a loose connection series arc and a damaged cable parallel arc and I expect it to detect those just as I'd expect the residual current function to detect me simulating an earth leakage fault. These tests, as far as I'm concerned, are real world enough. This device is supposed to pick up on high energy loose connections and damaged cables. And that's kind of the point. The next Elect show is in Exeter this week, and Hager will be back on their stand, singing the praises of this product. I'm sure anyone quizzing them about this video will be told I'm an idiot and my testing didn't reflect real-world arc signatures, which I don't believe is true. Well, maybe the idiot bit. But Hager have their own demo rig on the stand, which injects arcs in a way that also isn't real-world. Show us inside the box, Hager. There's a PCB in there telling their demo AFDD how to trip off. That's cheating. My fireworks are more real world than that fancy test rig, and the faults I've subjected it to today could easily be naturally occurring through a circuit with a loose connection or chewed cable. A quick rattle through the coffees to so the, uh, the sponsors of this channel. Thank you as usual to uh, all those who have contributed. Not too many to get through, so don't worry, it's not going to be too boring. Okay, first of all, Andy Payne, who is a whore, of course, familiar name to us. I say us, there's only me here now, I've got to stop saying us. Uh, and as Andy says, sad to see Nigel move on, as it was always funny seeing you give him shit. Yes, well, he's, he's gone and forgotten, Andy, so don't worry about him. We have a virgin in the name of Ricky Holland. Thanks for the training test rig article and video. Well, I'm glad somebody got something out of that. That was a lot of hard work last Christmas. So uh, you're quite welcome, Ricky. Hope it's useful for you. Speaking of test rigs, the whores that are test gear junkie who are in possession of the test rig that I built for that video, as it was their idea, uh, they say they must give it a thorough workout soon as it's been too bloody hot recently. Now, I imagine that, uh, that was perhaps two weeks ago when there was a bit of a, uh, a mini heat wave. We had our one week of hot weather and then it just turned to shit again. Uh, thank you, test gear junkie. Uh, whore in the name of Nigel Tupman. Obviously Nigel is a regular contributor to this channel and the only Nigel who is now welcome here. So uh, you've got to have one Nigel, you are it Mr Tupman. Cheers again he says. Well cheers to you old chap. Another whore in the name of David Patterson. Uh, greetings again from across the Irish Sea says David. Uh, top of the evening to you David. I hope you're on the Guinness over there. I've not had Guinness since since I went to Ireland in 2019, as I think I've mentioned before. I really must get back onto the black stuff. And uh, speaking of people who are well, not here, <laughs> Jim Hook, all the way over in that Australia. Uh, minor inconvenience is like a heart attack have deprived me of the opportunity to donate to Dave's Buy Me A Liver Fund. I'm so sorry to hear that, Jim. I do hope that uh, you're not too badly affected and you're on the mend, old chap. Do let me know. And finally, uh, we have a virgin in the name of Stephen. Keep them coming. Uh, since I started tuning into your vlogs, fires and electrocutions at my installs have dramatically reduced. Well, I'm, I'm glad to hear it, Stephen. Well done, you. Uh, there's supposed to be two special mentions. I was thinking the other day, I really must write these down because I'm going to forget somebody's name. And in true... Devo Savo style, I got drunk and I've forgotten one of them. So uh, I, I do apologise if I'm not reading out your name here, but uh, don't worry, don't worry. Another video is coming in the next week or so. Uh, I'm sure I'll remember in a moment of clarity at some stage when I sober up. But Alan Linegar, uh, thank you for the Avo Meter 2001, which is sat on my shelf of interesting cack. But let's just get that down, shall we? Very similar in style to the or at least in size, to the Fluke uh, 8020A. 
This one still actually seems to do something as well. But display still works there. Last calibrated June 1986. Where were you in 1986? I'd uh, just started my secondary school, I think. But yes, that's a rather wonderful thing, isn't it? I'm going to have to have a, a little bit of a play with that when I get a few minutes, but I'll, I'll just balance that up there for now and hope it doesn't topple over and land on my head. No super wanks to read out, so that's it for this vid. There is a safer September vid that will hopefully be out for October, because that's another one that's stuck in development hell. I'm sorry I couldn't show you this fucking Hager thing working today. Um, I really had intended to you know, see it in action and show you it logging the various faults that I applied to it. Maybe I've got a duff one, maybe they're not all like this. I don't know, but I mean, what do you reckon I should do? I'm thinking that I should send it back to Consumer Unit World and say, I don't think this works, kids. Yeah, it's uh, an interesting one. If indeed you find this kind of cack interesting. Anyway, catch you on the next one, kids.